Hello 3D printing friends, today on the BV3D channel we'll take a look at the Focus Odin 5 F3 3D printer. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. This episode of the BV3D channel is brought to you in part by these awesome channel members. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the Focus Odin 5 F3 3D printer. Big thanks to the nice people at Focus for sending this over for review. So I think I'm a little late to the Focus party because this one's been out for a little while, but I have to say the Odin 5 F3 is an interesting printer. It comes in a really nice retail-ready package, like I could definitely see this on the shelf at a big box store. With this kind of packaging, I get the sense that Focus is trying to target first-time 3D printer buyers with this model. It has a build volume of 235 millimeters on the x-axis, 235 millimeters on the y-axis, and 250 millimeters on the z-axis. That's kind of become the standard for mid-size FDM 3D printers. It has dual Z-axis stepper motors and flat flex cables to get the power and signals to the print head. It has a 0.4 millimeter brass nozzle that can be heated up to 260 degrees Celsius and a manually leveled glass bed that can be heated up to 135 degrees Celsius. It has a nice touch screen interface, a 32-bit main board with socketed stepper motor drivers, a USB port to connect it to your computer, and a micro SD card slot for printing G-code files. And it has a direct drive extruder with a very stealthy filament runout sensor. In the box with the printer, you'll find a nice complement of tools, including a quick start guide, a manual, a small spool of filament, a power cable, a USB cable, spare flex cables, some spare nozzles, a couple of open ended wrenches, a set of hex wrenches, and a micro SD card and a USB card reader. The Focus Odin 5 F3's big feature is its super simple assembly process, which basically amounts to unfolding the printer, bolting the gantry in its full upright and locked position, and plugging in the flat flex cables. Oh, and bolting on the filament spool holder. After that, it's a matter of adjusting the bed so it's at the same level as the nozzle when the nozzle is homed on the Z-axis, loading some filament, and printing. Now, that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but not by much. Now, one thing I did notice is that the unit I received had the eccentric nuts on the bed's V-slot wheels set a little bit too tightly, so I adjusted those. In fact, it's a good idea to always check these wheels on a new 3D printer, on the bed, on the X-carriage, and on the Z-axis, and adjust them if they need it. The micro SD card contains the manuals and quick start guides as PDF files, some STL files for printable replacement parts, a handful of models to slice yourself, including some owls, a benchy, a lucky cat, and everyone's favorite STL, the Shia LaBust. For better or for worse, like other 3D printers, it comes with a branded version of Cura to slice 3D models for printing. Unfortunately, there's only a Windows version, no Mac or Linux versions of it. Mac users are directed to download Cura directly from Ultimaker, and of course, Linux users should do the same. So I said it comes with a branded version of Cura, but that's not entirely true. The card included with the unit that I received came with a folder for it, but the installer wasn't there. One email to focus later, and I had a link to the installer that I could download. Usually, when companies compile a branded version of Cura, it seems like the main purpose is to include only printer configurations and printing profiles for their printers. And all the other printers that Cura normally comes with get left out. Well, that and it gets their company logo up on the screen. But then you're left behind when Ultimaker updates Cura and the maker of the printer doesn't. To me, it seems that if a printer manufacturer has gone to the trouble of creating printer settings and print profiles for their printer in Cura, they should make them available as a printer configuration you can download and import into Cura, and submit those configurations to Ultimaker via whatever method Ultimaker prefers to have them included in the next official release. All that aside, however, Focus does include enough information so you can set up the F3 in the standard version of Cura, which is great. And frankly, since it's got the same build volume as an Ender 3 series printer, you can just add an Ender 3, which is already available in Cura, and set its name to Focus Odin 5 F3. I've done this on the Mac with good results. So let's move on to the touchscreen and its user interface. It has four big menu buttons on the main screen. Tool, 
settings, auto load, and printing. The tool menu has options for preheating the nozzle and bed, moving the X, Y, and Z axes, homing the print head, manually leveling slash tramming the bed, and loading and unloading filament. The filament loading and unloading feature works pretty well, and it will heat the nozzle to 200 degrees Celsius before it tries to do anything with the filament. The settings menu has options for configuring an optional Wi-Fi module, turning the parts cooling fan on or off, machine settings, which are probably best left alone, disabling the stepper motors, and setting the language used on the screen. Auto load, I think, is intended to be a quick way to load filament. Unfortunately, it will happily start pulling filament in even with the nozzle at room temperature, so it's best to tap tools and then filament to load filament. And finally, the printing menu is the place to go when you want to select a G-code file from the microSD card to print. This is pretty straightforward. Navigate through the screens of files, tap the one you want, then confirm that you want to print it. It's probably a good idea to have only a few files on the card at any one time to make it easier to find the one that you want. I noticed that the pre-sliced G-code files actually had icons showing the model. Now this is great because there's not a lot of room for file names on the screen. Being able to pick the model by seeing its picture is really helpful. These previews are generated by the MKS Wi-Fi plugin for Cura. There are instructions in the manual for setting this up, but the plugin has been updated since those instructions were created. And it was very frustrating for me trying to figure out how to get the current plugin to work and to create the images. I couldn't find it documented anywhere on the plugin's GitHub page, so I'll save you the trouble of figuring out. Here's how to set up that plugin. First, click the Marketplace button in Cura here. Sometimes it'll take a while for it to load up all the Marketplace items, but once it does, scroll through to find the MKS Wi-Fi plugin and then install it. To complete the installation, Cura will need to quit, and then you will need to open Cura up again. Next, enable the plugin for the printer. From the printer list, click Manage Printers, and then click the MKS Wi-Fi plugin button for this printer. Click this checkbox here to enable it. Then in the Preview Settings tab, check the box for Screenshot Support. Set S image to 100 and G image to 200. Then close out of it. The next time you slice a file for this printer and save it, your G-code files will have the preview images embedded in them and the printer will display them on the screen. So speaking of G-code files and printing and stuff like that, I printed some things. One of the things I printed was this cool vase from designer Clockspring. I like this one because it's really interesting. It's nine pieces, all printed in spiral vase mode. There's the main part, which I printed in a silk pink PLA, and then eight inserts, which I printed in a silk white PLA. The inserts slide down into the main part with a bit of a twist. And really, this came out great. The inserts were actually the most challenging part of it because they're tall, skinny pieces. But they stuck really well to the bed instead of snapping off or falling over. The tops of some of them aren't perfect because the PLA itself was flexing a little bit, and so the nozzle was causing it to deflect slightly from its original position. But they all completed, and because of the texture on the design, you can't tell unless you're really looking closely at them. Another clock springy model that I printed was the Bonnie gear top box. This one has some sliding levers that move some gears to open and close the top of the box. Plus, it has some gears for eyes, and the big gear on the bottom kind of looks like teeth. This one I sliced with Prusa Slicer and printed with some green filamentum PLA that I've had for several years. Now, I actually printed it twice. The first one of these I printed, the fit of the gears was just a little bit too tight, so it was hard to make it move. So I adjusted the XY compensation in Prusa Slicer by a tiny bit, just a tenth of a millimeter. Now, that made it looser, maybe a tiny bit too loose. There was one little problem with that change. It made it so that these two pieces were now no longer able to stay together. It worked out, though, because that piece is actually held in place by this printed screw. And that just goes to show you test prints aren't always perfect, but <laughs> that's okay. Next, I loaded some printed solid Jesse PLA, the design white color, and I printed Shia LaBust. This was one of the pre-sliced models on the card that came with the printer. It came out pretty good. He's got a little bit of stubble on his chin, though. Ooh. Oh no, I dropped it. Now it's got a scratch on it. That's okay, don't worry. I'm sure it'll buff out. 
onward to a Calicat printed in some gold silk PLA from Polymaker. Now, as soon as I saw this one, I was feline pretty good about the print quality. I also printed a golden Benchy. It has a couple of golden barnacles on it, too. But, you know, it looks pretty good apart from those. No stringing, not really any ringing, and the overhangs look good, too. When your printer gives you the Golden Benchy Award, you know your ship has come in. Honestly, I like this filament, so I printed Aria in the gold silk, too. She came out really good and just had a few little wispy strings between the front legs. The lower part of her tail around back looks like it's suffering from barnacle syndrome, too. But it didn't seem to happen anywhere else on the print, so I don't think it was related to parts cooling. Well, that's enough of the prints. I'll stop dragging this out and get on with it. So let's go over the things I like, the things I don't like, and where I think this could use a bit of improvement. Here are the things I like. I like the direct drive extruder. It's compact, and it's got an integrated filament runout sensor. I also like that Focus includes printable replacement parts on the card with the printer. And I like the touchscreen. The interface is easy to use. It seems to offer as much control as the standard monochrome screen and knob system that you'd find on the Ender 3 Pro. But if you're used to the older interface, you'll need to learn the new layout. 3D printer touch interfaces are still evolving. I think they're coming along reasonably well. I took a quick peek inside the printer and was super happy to see that Focus is using wire ferrules on the ends of the high current wiring going into and out of the printer's mainboard. I've got a whole video about why ferrules are a good thing, so check this card up here if you want to know more. In the things I don't like department, as happy as I was to see Focus using ferrules on the wiring, there was something that had me scratching my head. The lack of strain relief on the wiring going to the heated bed. While there's a bit of strain relief where the wire is attached to the bed, there's no cable grommet and no method of securing the wiring where it exits the back of the printer. Pulling hard on this cable pulls hard on the connectors on the mainboard, so I really think Focus should have some sort of a cable grommet and strain relief right here where the cable exits the printer's case. While I like the touch interface on the screen, when selecting a file to print, it displays files that are normally hidden on desktop operating systems. You'll see the dot files that Macs like to put on disks and media cards, and you'll see the Windows System Volume Information folder. I think this is something that could easily be addressed by a firmware update for the screen. Adding in a bit of logic, as simple as if file name begins with a period, then hide file, would go a long way. And I wasn't impressed with the power loss recovery feature. To test it, I turned off power to the printer after having printed a few layers of a Calicat model. Then I turned it on again and tapped the resume button on the screen. The printer got the nozzle and the bed back up to temperature, homed the X and Y axes, and then put the nozzle back where it was when the power went out. But before actually resuming the print, the printer spent several seconds extruding a big blob of filament in the middle of the Calicat's right front foot. It was such a big blob that on subsequent layers, the nozzle would hit the blob and the stepper motors would skip, and as a result, there was some layer shifting going on. But I let it finish anyway, and now I have a somewhat malformed Calicat. I swear, I have the worst luck with the power loss recovery feature on 3D printers. Sometimes it works fine, and sometimes this. In the improvements department, I'd like to see Focus include updated instructions regarding the use of the MKS Wi-Fi plugin for generating the thumbnail and preview images of the G-code files. And I think bed probes are becoming more of a standard, so Focus could really make things easy for first-time 3D printer owners by including one and by attaching the bed to the Y carriage using solid mounts instead of springs and adjustment knobs. Let the printer figure out where the bed surface is by using the probe, and then all the user has to do is adjust the Z offset. To me, that's easier than moving the nozzle around the bed and turning knobs. Since the gantry doesn't self-align vertically at 90 degrees during assembly, I think if there was some kind of a hard stop when the gantry reaches that position, it would make assembly that much more accurate. If nothing else, I think it would be nice if Focus included a cheap 90-degree squaring jig that could be used to ensure that the gantry was squared to the base. So that's the Focus Odin 5 F3. Overall, it's a pretty good printer, and it has a lot of the things people seem to want in a mid-size FDM 3D printer these days. Dual Z motors, direct drive, and a touchscreen interface. The price is reasonable, too. It's competitive. So if you're considering an FDM 3D printer in the mid to high $200 range, you might want to put this one on your list of printers to look at. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, 
Let's go print something cool. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this episode, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you can do exactly that. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free, and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BV3D channel.